where nobody is actively leading the talk unless there's a problem, and then we just demonstrate a solution to the problem. So what I suggest today is I will introduce the boot camp. You can put your hands on some R software towards the end. I'll, there'll be a time where I'll stop and I'll, but I think I want to show for beginners, I want to show how I intended the boot camp to be used, and I wanted to show it very explicitly. So I'll, I'll do some demonstrations towards the end. And then for the future meetings, we will, um, we will um, work together in here tutorial style. I'm going to share my screen. Let me, uh, let me launch the session first. Share screen. Boom. Get my trusty laser pin going. There we go. There we go. All right. I'm going to try to get the chat. Joe, if, if I could ask you or somebody else to just keep an eye on the chat, if anybody has a question, or just unmute yourself. But if anybody notices, thank you. OK. <clears throat> All right, uh, I wanted to mention last time we did this uh, GitHub web page thing, and a couple of people showed me some successes. So if you have have put up a web page, even if you haven't filled it with content yet, why don't you drop us a link into the GitHub, uh, I mean into the Slack rather. Uh, another thing is if you've tried and had a little snag, um, go ahead and uh, you know feel free to ask questions or uh, let's get it sorted out in Slack. Let's try to do that. So I noted that there were a few successes. Peter, is Peter here today? Good, I can embarrass him a little bit. He um, he uh, went all out and used a, a template from Hugo, I think, to format his own web page. So he went beyond the basics, and his looks pretty slick. Okay, <clears throat> another thing I want to do is to announce. Um, now, I have mentioned this before. In here, and I think some people said they were interested. But uh, at the best of times, especially during these meetings, I, I tend to have like three or four things occupying my mind at the same time. And uh, but what I have announced is that, that some people have expressed an interest to learn Python. Now this is aimed at doing more, probably more computationally ambitious stuff than just statistics. Um, I'm, I have a, I'm of the very strong opinion that if if you want to do statistics, R is the best environment, and it's the easiest environment as well, um, by far, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But if you want to do more computationally ambitious stuff, like machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, computer vision, um, I am now, um, I'm now of the mind that Python is the best. And if you're if you're doing modern data science, if you're if you're aware of that world, I think that to be a um, well rounded data science uh, practitioner that you would you would have to use both programming languages R and Python to be well rounded. So anyway, we started a new group, the happy group, Harper Adams Python enthusiasts group first meeting for for beginners from a standing start if you're interested is this friday at 1 p.m uh, a few people who i could remember expressed interest i've already added to the list but if you would like me to add you to the list whether or not you can attend the session friday if you're interested and want to get the emails and the link to the invite just drop me an email juliana i'll try to make a note because you said it before and i have definitely forgotten you let me just make a note. Anybody else while I've got my trusty notepad here? Eugenia, you also said it before and I also forgot you. I'm so sorry. Anyone else who didn't get the email? If, if you do think about it or you think anybody might be interested, have them email me. That'll be similar to this. Um, Nyan Burra. Okay, gotcha. 
All of you will receive an email after this and El Sadiq, okay? Okay. All right, gotcha. Okay, onward. Um, I did already say this about the web pages. All right, so what, what we're gonna do today. Now the, um, the, the data science garage exists as a series of web pages. And uh, the link is, is right here. Nyambura, I got you, you're on the list. I'll give you an email too. Um, and I'm just gonna drop the link in the chat right now if you wanna have a look at the same time but uh, I will tell you about it. Uh, that's the link, it's in the slide. And basically what this um, page is about, okay, Gustavo, you're on. All right, Gustavo. I should just email it out to all of the people, maybe. Okay, so here's the spirit. You have the traditional boot camp with people yelling at you for your own good, possibly. Tough love is a traditional boot camp, but that is not the spirit. I'm too soft for that personally. And the spirit of my boot camp is let's let's be in this together. If we see a friend who's a little slower, let's wait for them and let's help them. But maybe let's do some fun, ambitious stuff too. And that is it is in that that spirit that I've done this boot camp. So it is for people who are just beginning. Uh, I also, I'm very aware and I'm very interested in this, even as a researcher with all of my, my powers as a researcher, I'm very interested in the fact that I've observed in my whole career that different people learn in different ways. One way that people like to learn these days is through self-guided tutorial style stuff on the web. That is the style that I've, I've made for this boot camp, but there are other styles that doesn't work for everybody equally well. Maybe maybe just a, um, a cheat sheet or a help card is good for some people, or maybe some people like to watch videos, and maybe some people need some one-to-one -one help. So um, the main focus of the boot camp is to create this self-guided resource, but it can be supported with all of those other modes, and we can support each other in it. Um, the main learning outcomes are going to be to uh, get an idea about what the R programming language is all about and how to use it for statistical analysis. Um, we're assuming no prior knowledge here, but I, I think that even people who do use statistics to analyze their own data probably can learn a few things through the boot camp, but it is mainly in, aimed at beginners. Um, I had in mind when I was making this material PhD students here at Harper, I I have not had much traction and I think the reason that I haven't with this is that uh, everybody's so busy and we've been under this lockdown. And for those of you, many of you have joined uh, as PhD students relatively recently within the last two years. I also have joined as a staff member within the last two years. Actually, I've just reached my two year mark at Harper. And the majority of that time has been working from home for me over like like uh, like 15 months has been working at home. Um, and so what I would like to do is to have all PhD students based on my interactions with many of you, many PhD students want to and should learn and practice statistical analysis. R is the best tool to do that, in my opinion. Many of you want to learn R with even without me goading you on. So I had PhD students in mind. I think the boot camp should be offered as a as a, a, a maybe a mandatory thing when you first start or at least offered for professional development. So I'm working on that, but we can do it informally now. Also, though, academic colleagues, whoops, if I um, if I have academic colleagues that that supervise students, master students that come through my um, EDA class, uh, but also PhD students. Many of you also, and I see some of you are even here, want to learn R, and it'll be fun and more efficient. It will save you work if you are supervising students who are using R. If you know enough R to understand what they're doing and and help support them, even even intellectually. You don't even have to 
um, know enough are to write code yourself. Postgraduate students, I, I, the proximate reason I wrote this was for um, for MSc students on the data science course. So mixed MSCs for the data science course. But you know anybody uh, can use this stuff. It is openly available on the, on the web. So um, we're going to focus on the basics of our programming syntax. Um, best practice for making scripts that are a document of your analysis for yourself, but also so that you can get help easily from other people. Staying tidy data, which we have talked about in here before, and just a review of simple statistics, just enough statistics. Now, the statistics we're reviewing are what I call old fashioned statistics or simple statistics. They're still all in wide use. All of you will know about them and probably have used them even recently. Chi square, correlation simple linear regression, analysis of variance, non-parametric alternatives. That's not enough statistics these days to do science, not even out of the gate. You also need to know about the generalized linear model and other interesting tools. So we talk about those in this class, but for the boot camp, we're going to stick to just old fashioned statistics. This is the structure. Joe is probably thinking he never wanted to see this again in his life, but here it is right on the page. Um, I've divided this into three modules. The first module is uh, is just basically an introduction to good practice and, and how to use R and the software tools that make using R easier. So R Studio primarily and how to set up a script. Module two is that review of practicing using R for, for old fashioned statistics. Most of the pages in module three, Joe created and the focus was on um, reproducibility, reproducible code, markdown language within the R ecosystem and GitHub. So we've already started working on this stuff. And these, these days, these are the tools that make your, make your life easy and are best practice. So that's what the boot camp represents. Um, this is a little small, but I just did a screenshot of the, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Maybe I'll just go ahead and show you now. If I drag over the boot camp page, um, if you go to the, the link that I dropped in the chat, the landing page looks like this. Th this, all of this website was actually made as a GitHub web page. It lives on GitHub in a repository, my personal GitHub, but it's formatted with a, a little bit of a fancier tool that Joe has shown us before. And I was inspired by Joe's talk earlier to do it, just to learn and, and to do it. But all of the bootcamp lives on this tab up here. I'll just make it a little bit bigger called bootcamp. If you click on it, the the template for this website is based on a blog template and all the bootcamp pages sort of look like blog posts. But when you click on one, the one that we'll um, look at first today, the bootcamp intro, I'm just going to make it smaller to, to show you the whole page fast. Is It really lives as a tutorial that you read through and uh, eventually for subsequent pages after today, you'll actually type and run the code yourself and every single page has some practice exercises, usually five or six questions. OK, so uh, the first module has got uh, syntax basics, functions and packages, um, data objects, how to get different kinds of data in and tidy data, the special data object in R for, for data sets called a data frame, and then how to manipulate the data. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I wouldn't say this is the best way to organize this kind of information, but it's the most logical way to organize this information. What I wanted to say as an aside here that um, there's a, a concept, it's a philosophical concept that was invented when people are trying to learn statistics, math, and programming who aren't trained in it before. And the, the concept is called the mathematician's lament. And the lament, I'll say the lament in about 
two sentences. The lament is this. I may have even said it in some form before in here that if we're teaching art people to be uh, artists, uh, we might want to show them a lot of pretty pictures first or creative things and get them thinking about how to create. But in practice in schools, we, we might we might teach them um, about color theory and the physics of refractants and um, the um, molecular structure of pigments. And we might do that for years and years before we actually get up to showing them a real picture. That, that is the way that we tend to teach statistics and programming. We teach the little building blocks while you actually just want to learn something from your data, but we have to start way back in the past. Nevertheless, even with the mathematician's lament, this is how it's structured, learning some of the basic building blocks. Module two is um, each page is a little bite-sized chunk of old-fashioned statistics with, with examples that should be relevant to you all, including some experimental design, field trials, stuff like that. Module three is just three pages that are um, uh, on the topic of reproducibility, Markdown, and GitHub. <clears throat> All right, so um, there are two little modules that that are before the three main modules. And if I if I show you this again, they're right up at the top. These are meant to be done in exactly the order of, that they appear. The boot camp overview, I've just conceptually gone through the idea. It's just a few paragraphs of stuff to read. The boot camp intro is is what we're going to work through a little bit in slides and a little bit explicitly, but really I intended this page just to give you the idea, but I want to show you by the end of today how I envision you using, every one of you using the boot camp material who wants to learn this stuff. All right, so if you haven't already done so, a thing I'm not going to demonstrate today um, is that you should install R and R Studio. If you haven't already done that, um, there are a few caveats. Maybe you've installed R and R Studio a long time ago. My recommendation is, unless you've built some big project that's very complex, that would take significant effort to to reproduce in R. If you've already done that in R, um, for every other situation, I, I would recommend just go ahead and in, installing the newest version of R and then installing the newest version of our studio. The instructions and links are on, on that web page. The reason for that is that there have been some significant changes in R. It's continually developed all for the better, um, as far as I'm aware. And um, our studio is developed hand in hand with R, even though they're technically unrelated projects. And both are, uh, R is open source. The R Studio is not open source, but it's free for us to use. Um, I intend you to read the pages and think about them. They're not intended to be skimmed. There are some parts in there that if you skim and miss, um, you're going to be you're going to be stuck. Uh, you can always get help. Uh, and again, there are instructions for this um, on the pages. I have made a special boot camp Slack page don't bother joining that one. Just put any questions in our Harper R, uh, Harper Adams R users group, the Herrig Slack channels. But but really, you could use either one. Um, we're in both of them. But I do intend you to read the pages carefully. Uh, sometimes there are even links to a few things that I think are important to read, but very little of that. It's mostly practical. And I intend you to, to run all the code. Um, every bit of code you see in there, it is so easy to read my code. I'm not, I'm not bigging myself up when I say that my code is going to be perfect. It's going to run. You may find one or two typos, but it's pretty much all going to be very simple. It's all going to be perfect. It's all going to run. But if you merely read my code, my perfect code, you're not going to learn as quickly. And furthermore, you can copy and paste my code, but I don't intend you to do that. I literally intend you to type every line of code. You'll learn faster if you do that. I'll demonstrate it today, and I'll demonstrate that next week. The other thing I intend you to do is to make a, a script 
using and practicing best practice starting today. I'll give you a template script today, which I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate to you, and I'll show you a little bit about file management. Again, this is meant for beginners, but I, these are the way that I intended this material to be used. OK, so embedded in this um, day one R page, the 0 0.1 page, is a is a real tour of R Studio. <clears throat> and I mentioned that I would like you to install R Studio in R, but um, I forgot to mention um, R Studio Cloud. And um, there is a link on the bootcamp page. If you find yourself in a situation that you have Let's say you have a, a Chromebook or an Android based operating system um, and you can't install R. Or worse, if you find yourself with a Harper Adams IT laptop and they only they have admin rights, you can ask them to install this stuff for you and um, they will come and do it. But if you're in some other situation where you just can't install it, um, you do have an option. The option is R Studio Cloud. You can sign up as a student or another kind of interesting person. All interesting people can um, sign up for an RStudio Cloud account for free, and you get 25 hours of free cloud use per month. But I'll I'll even I'll even go one better and say that if you remember, some of you were here and some of you weren't. For a few weeks ago, I gave a demonstration of running your own virtual R Studio server. If you want to use my R Studio server, you can use it unlimited for free. Just send me an email if you don't have your username and password. Uh, if you do want to use that, you may have to send me an email for me to turn the server back on. Um, I've given you a link here to the anchor point for the page uh, that takes you directly to the place for R Studio Cloud if you're interested in that option. You can store data and everything up there, and if you really want to get into it, you could just pay for R Studio Cloud. It's not that expensive, but you might want to use it for free. Um, before we go to this, I, I do want to show, since this is a day one um, meeting, I want to show what our studio looks like when it first starts. If I if I close this, when you first start our studio, um, it will look something like this. And you have to do stuff to make it do work for you. <laughs> and it is very foreign if you've only used a graphical user interface. But if I just click up here on the file menu, um, we have a, all sorts of file types. So what our studio is is it is a, um, a graphical user interface, a GUI for programming languages. Why do we need this? Well, technically you don't need it, but it also has a lot of little tools that make your life much easier, make it much easier to use R and get the most out of R, especially for beginners. So the one that we always want is an R script. Now an R script is just a plain text file. And if we open up a plain untitled R script, we have the basic default layout. I use the default layout. I don't do anything cute. The only thing I've changed from the default layout in my installation is the aesthetics of the coloring scheme. And if you would like to change that, you can go to Tools, Global Options, Appearance. And if you would like it to look exactly like mine, you can choose Pastel on Dark. Pastel on Dark. It's very dark here. It's easy on the eyes, but you can explore the other themes too. All right, so um, this is the script window in the upper left. And usually the way we use R is we, we issue commands that we would like the computer to, to execute for us in our script. And the script acts as a document for all of our commands. And usually we want to aim for building a script that documents an entire analysis, an entire figure that represents our data or other work that we do, and we save it. We save that script as a, um, not just as a document um, for ourselves that we can build on, add to, edit, um, or maybe refer to in the future 
by copying and pasting and recycling some code that was was good for us that we've invested work into, but also so that we can share it with others. So you could get feedback, so you can consult with me, so that you can show it to your supervisor. All right, so um, the way that we make the computer do the work is we have to submit it to the system. We'll talk about this and demonstrate it a little bit more, but we have the output console where the answer comes out. So one plus one is just a command. I'm gonna execute it. I'll show you how to execute it in a, um, in a couple of slides in a few minutes. But down here, what we see is the response is that we have an echo of the command that I issued, and we have a line of, of output um, with the answer. So this is the pattern of, of work. We have inputs up here. We submit it to the system. We have outputs down here in the console. Notice there are a few tabs down here. The console is where the answers come out for the R system. We can actually um, type commands directly into the console and we get them out. I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger for people. But we usually don't do that. We usually only use the, um, the script. We also have a terminal. If you're um, used to using a Linux system or if you use the command and control center, uh, the text-based bash console in Max, this terminal emulates that environment for, for Windows. I'm using a Windows computer here today. We also have an R markdown window. Um, that's for converting um, markdown commands to HTML. And we have jobs for um, uh, things that are running in the background. But usually we're going to stick right on the console command. Up here in the upper right, in this area, we have our environment. Uh, you'll see in a few weeks, if you stick with this boot camp, that I call this window R space. This is where we see data objects. If I were to make a data object called X and put a value of one in it, up in our environment, the value X and its, um, its value, the contents of the container called X pop up in our environment window. We also have a history of our commands. I've got a lot of history. There's a lot of, a lot of terrible stuff in my history. Uh, connections. This is for uh, doing advanced stuff, connecting to servers. And uh, there is even a tutorial tab that you can look at and play with yourself. But we'll mostly stick up here in the environment tab. Our global environment tells us what, what data we have in the environment. And then we have the lower right. We have a uh, file viewer. I usually don't use the R file navigator, but um, some people like it. I usually stick to the plots window. When we make a plot, it will appear here. There's a manual interface for packages. We haven't learned about them yet, but this is add-ons to R that we can add. And the help. And we use the help viewer a lot. This is something that you, even if it's easier for you, you think, to Google for an answer if you're having a problem in R. You, you must train yourself if you want to be an efficient and proficient R user to use this help um, window. And we'll do that together in the boot camp. So for now, we'll just leave it on the blank plots window. All right, so that's a, just a, the barest overview of what uh, R Studio is like. So um, what you'll see on this first page is uh, you'll be able to read a little bit about how to set up your first script. And I think that for any script, the minimum script has to have a few points, uh, a few sections in it specifically to be best practice. And I provide you on this page a template for my way of setting up this script. Any of you who have worked with me, any of you who have been in my EBA class, and most of you who have been here in these meetings, you already know what I'm going to tell you, that that script has got to have a header that has basic information about the contents of your script. It's got to have a table of contents that allows, at a glance, right near the top of the script, some structure for what's in the script. 
and it should also have clickable sections or code chunks that um, represent those items in the contents section. And it should be littered liberally with comments. The minimum amount of comments are best, but there should be um, comments that allow anybody to pick the script up and understand what it's doing, even if they haven't spoken to you. My rule of thumb for comments and setting up a script is that you should pretend you're writing it for somebody else, somebody who is very important and who can help you, uh, somebody that you have a lot of respect for, and maybe you have a little bit of fear for them as well. So that's how you should write your scripts. That's how I write my scripts. So I'm going to demonstrate now um, what that first script looks like. And, and actually, at this point, I'm going to do uh, something with my screen. It's the way that I intend this um, page to be used is um, if we if we look right up at the top, I've got a link to a script. And if I just right click, I'm going to I'm going to save the link as and I'm going to um, download it to a folder that I made. Uh, it may be hard for you to see this up here, but I made a little folder inside our Herrig group um, folder on my computer that I call my bootcamp folder. And I'm just saving this script. It's called script 0.1.r. Now, our script files end with that extension .r. It allows our, our studio to recognize this plain text file as a our studio our script file. I'm not going to save this again because I've already saved it, as you can see. Instead, I'm going to um, show you that folder on my computer and just show you um, what happens when I open up a script that's been saved. But for, first, before I do that, I want to show you what it looks like in Notepad. So just a text file. This whole script is just, just plain text. It's very tiny. Um, but if I open it up with RStudio, I could have done this through the menu, by the way. Now I've made a, um, a header, and uh, we have to know a little bit of syntax, which uh, you can read about on this, this first page. We make comments to ourselves or to that respected important person with, um, with one hash symbol at the beginning of a line, and everything after it won't be recognized as code that R would run. The minimum information for your header uh, you know, I make mine visually so that it pops out just like this with two hashes. And um, I put who um, has made it. I put a link if it's relevant. I put what the contents are. And I usually put a date um, that it was last edited on. Of course, you would put your own name. You might put a sentence about what analysis or what data set it is. You could put anything up here. You put the minimum that would allow somebody else who you respect and fear just a little bit to know what the script is about. Okay. I have another little trick here that is specific to our studio that has become part of my standard arsenal, which I think is um, good uh, practice, is that if you have a comment starting a line that starts with at least one hash mark and you put some text in there, if that line ends with at least four hash marks, you see this little, I'm mousing over here, I can't make it any bigger for you, but there's a little symbol. And if I click on that symbol, it folds this section. This section is called a code chunk. So that syntax that I've given you in this starter script has code chunks built in. So this is the, part, the first um, line of a code chunk, and a code chunk ends when it meets a new code chunk. So when I click this little fold, it folds the whole code chunk. That is, with a, such a small script, it doesn't really have a, a function. But even a very small analysis will have 100 lines of code. Ones that are bigger might have 1,000 lines of code. Most, most scripts I write, including graphs and everything for your average publication, might have 2,000 lines of code if it's a simple analysis 
uh, with three, four graphs um, or, or more. So it becomes more important the bigger a script mutates, the bit more ambitious it is. There's another thing our studio does that I love is when you make a code chunk, there's a little symbol over here that if we click it, it opens a, a clickable table of contents. And if you name your section something um, like with numbers, you can click on them and, and navigate to a big script. And there's a second way to do this. I'm just going to close that one. Down here at the bottom, you can navigate it down there as well. Just a different visual style. The second code chunk I like is a contents. And it just uh, it's a code chunk, we can see. We can fold it. It's a code chunk of its own. And it also has um, some, some simple sections. Uh, so I'm going to just, this is just an example section. We're going to look at the so-called iris data. Um, and we're going to make a simple graph with the iris data. Now, one of the reasons to show you this is to show you the structure of this um, script. And if, if you're following along with me, or if you're going to do it afterwards, um, there is one little bit of information that is it's just um, in one little paragraph on that first page, and that's how to actually submit your commands. So uh, if I go down to this code, code chunk to look at the iris data, <clears throat> the iris data is a famous data set. It um, was collected by a researcher called Anderson, and I think it was collected even as far back as um, the 19th century, may maybe even in the 18th century. I can't remember exactly when, it, but uh, it was actually made famous by the statistician R.A. Fisher, and it's often called Fisher's irises, and it's one of the um, data sets that's built in to R and because it's a good example and many people know the structure of the data set. What it is, is it is three species of irises. There's a factor with the species of iris, of plant flowers in the genus iris. Um, and then for each individual of those 150 individuals, so there are three species, 50 individuals per species, 150 total rows in this data set. There are four measures. There's um, petal width and length, and um, one other measure in width and length. Now, to load the data, what we have to do is submit it. And uh, there are many ways to submit your commands. It's just personal preference. If you click anywhere on the line, there's a, a button up here that just says run. Um, if you mouse over it, it just says run the current line or selection. It's a little small, the text, but you may just be able to see there's also a shortcut called control enter. In Max, it's um, someone can yell at me if this isn't true, but I think it's the command enter or the Apple command enter in, by default in Max. But it's control enter in Windows. Um, <clears throat> and uh, to get this data loaded, we have to use the data function um on it and we get a promise so i can then hit my control enter on the next line notice just my cursors on the line now i can select the code i want to run i can just put my cursor on the line or i can just click this button up here so three different ways and it prints it and notice now up in the global environment my data set is no longer a promise it's now there so it's sepal length and width and petal length and width are the four measures. Notice up here in the global environment, we get a little view of what our data is. One of the things I see when people start using R compared to just using Excel or using GenStat or SPSS is that in those programs, we're used to seeing a visual representation of our data in a spreadsheet. Now, a spreadsheet is just a visual representation of a ledger that accountants use. It's just a way of organizing your data. And one of the, the difficulties in starting to use R is to, R, we can view our data as a spreadsheet in R as well. I'm not going to show that right now. But um, it's just that it stores data conceptually. 
it doesn't by default show us that spreadsheet and we and we can't point and click at individual um, at individual datums uh, in individual cells uh, by default. We can actually do that in R, but um, by default, that's not the intention of use. So it's a little bit conceptual. This head command allows us to see just the top of the data set, the head of the data set, if you will. And this allows us to see it in a um, in a view that is more familiar to us. So rows and columns, one column per variable, one row per individual. This is the default tidy data format that we've talked about in here before, and we'll look at in a week or two in the boot camp. <clears throat> All right, so um, this comment, so I've left breadcrumbs of comments to that respected, feared other person. This syntax with a question mark is the command that um, invokes the help function. If we do this, it will give us a little bit of help about the data object and the help pops up down here. We're not going to look at this in detail because we will look at how the help is used um, uh, during the boot camp, but it's just information. It's information about how to use different tools in R, in this case, how to use that stock data set that's an exemplar. And then finally, we can make a simple graph. I'm just going to select that. I'm going to hit the run button up here to run it. Down here, it should automatically switch over to the plot tab. And uh, what we've done, we don't have to worry about this now. We'll learn all about this. Is we've passed it a formula. We're going to look at sepal length, just one of the numeric variables. We've got this little symbol. Does anyone want to offer up what they call that little symbol, the little squiggle? Does anyone want to tell me what they call that? What do you call that little squiggle? I'll make it bigger. The tilde. Anybody else have something different from the tilde? No? Good. I call it the tilde or the tilde with an E at the end. Uh, tilde is uh, what most people call it. Um, squiggle. But uh, in R, it has a special meaning. Uh, it's got a syntax that means as a function of. So here we're going to look at sepal length. Traditionally, the, the dependent variable in an R formula like this is uh, on the right hand side as a function of species. And uh, we were telling it that the data is um, is iris. So I'm just going to select this, click the run button. My plot will pop up. Keep your eye down there in the lower right. Three, two, one. I've got my uh, magnification up a lot, so it looks a bit funny. Um, one of the idiosyncrasies of R that uh, you probably will recall in the future if you use R, that it, it is part of the challenge of using R is the way that graphics work. And the graphics in R by default are dependent on the resolution of your screen. I've increased the magnitude of my screen, and so the resolution looks poor. It looks low. And if I made the, if I zoomed out on the screen, this would look tight. Uh, tighter and the text would be smaller. But what we see here is sepal length. This is kind of an ugly title. We'll learn how to change the titles to make them more um, aesthetically pleasing in the future. And we've got the species and the species are set to the factor name. This is just a default R graph. Um, so that's how you submit commands. Let's go back to the slides here real quick. So that was my template script. Now, there are a couple of exercises here, and I, I mentioned to you that this, this isn't even part of the boot camp. This is still the pre boot camp. But for the exercises, I thought, well, I'll demonstrate how I intend the exercises to be done in the first instance. And starting next week, uh, I will still. I will still do the lab in real time with you, but I'll let you just get on with it. I probably won't talk unless there is a question. So we're just going to demonstrate how to do the first exercise together. There's a um, a link to that's actually not to the exercises. I meant to put in a link to um, to number four. 
so um, the practice exercises to number six, that is. <clears throat> so the practice exercises are down straight at the bottom of the page. Now, how I, how I would use these and how I had in mind people might use these pages is um, to have the page up at the same time as you have R. Whenever there's an opportunity to, to use code, to literally type it in yourself. So I'm going to demonstrate how I would do that on my own computer now. There are different ways to achieve this. You could use Alt-Tab whoops, to go back and forth between your computer and uh, the page, or some other way to change. You could manually just drag your windows around if you wanted to. The way that I'll show you is the way that I would do it natively, is I would use this little tool to bring the windows side by side so I could see them side by side. I'm going to make my script a little bit smaller here. Hopefully you can still see this. The first practice exercise um, instructs you to download this script. Now if you, I'm mousing over it and if you see down here in the very bottom of my screen, if you can see that, it's just this script that I have loaded up already. So it just prompts you to download the script, put it in a folder, and open it in RStudio. Before I clicked on the script, but you could use the file menu and uh, um, open a file that way, or Control-O. <clears throat> um, and, and essentially, for the first exercise, we've already gone through this first um, exercise. We have, uh, I'm going to drag this window all the way over for now. And what's more, I'm going to show you another little tool I sometimes use in our studio is I sometimes just um, with maximize and minimize, every little window has a maximize and minimize. So if I maximize the script window, I only see the script. If I minimize it, I will only see the bottom. And if I put the two window symbol, it'll bring back both of them. Okay. So if we just look at the script, this first practice exercise just says, download this script and simply run the code. It's the first hurdle. If you haven't used R before, it may be the biggest hurdle you encounter and it's all downhill from here. If you have any trouble when you do this on your own, or if somebody is attempting it right now, don't hesitate to speak up so we're all on the same page. Um, what I intend you to do for this first practice exercise is just to run the script, which I've just demonstrated for you in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Now, for the second exercise, the instruction is to add a code chunk title to your content section and, and to your script. So make sure to write brief comments and add the following code to your script. Now, of course, you could copy and paste this. Uh, I'm not going to harp on this a lot, but I may remind you a few times here and there. I don't intend you to copy and paste this. This is my perfect code. It will run. There probably won't be any syntactic errors in it. That's not the only way. I've written this code so that it's simple, so that respected and feared mentor will be impressed and will understand everything, even though I haven't talked talk to them. But um, I, I intend you to type this yourself. This is an important part. And I, I think, I observe over many years of teaching R, that it's the fastest way to learn R, even though it's going to be a little painful for you to force yourself. So here's the instruction. We're going to add a, a code chunk to our contents section. So I'm going to call this um, in the same syntax. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so people can see it a little bit better. Yell if if you need me to to adjust this. I'm going to number it. I like to explicitly number my sections because I think it's best practice and I think it's clearest. And I'm going to call this um, <clears throat> row exercise two. So uh, I've just added it to the content section. I'm just going to copy it because I also want to add the um, code chunk to my script for its own section. So I can go down to the bottom. I'm just going to bring this up by adding a few 
enter lines and I'm going to make my new code chunk. I like to leave, if I can remember to do it, two spaces between my code chunks. So two. And then I add my new code chunk. Remember to make this a code chunk, but just add the little sections, the little um, hash marks. Now look down here. I've got my header, my contents, my first code chunk, my second code chunk, but I don't have my, my second, um, my third code chunk, my number two code chunk. I have zero, 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 one. I don't have zero, two yet. And it's because the syntax has to be four hash lines at the end of the, um, at the line, four hash marks. So when I add my fourth, boom, I get my new clickable link down there. So now I've got my section. I'm going to add a little comment to myself here. New code chunk, my own typing. And now the instruction is just to add this code chunk. Well, what, what's the first one? The first one is create a new variable with a with a, a comment. I'm going to type in the comment. Then I'm going to, uh, what I've done here, We I haven't explained anything to you. This is literally just to learn how to type code and submit it to the R system. You may even get some errors if you have syntactic errors. The point of this is just to get used to the R system. But what I'm doing here, just to, by explanation, is I'm, I'm creating a container called my underscore variable. The greater than minus sign, this little syntax here, is um, one piece of syntax that's the assignment operator. Kind of works a little bit like an equal sign, but it's not quite the same as an equal sign. It puts something on one side of a um, an equation into something on the other side, and it it puts in the direction of the arrow of the of the little arrow. It's called the assignment operator uh, or the arrow operator, and it it works together as one one operator. And uh, this little C open bracket with a close bracket at the end. This is actually an R function. It's the first one you've encountered. I haven't even told you what a function is, but you can ignore that for now. This just says that I'm going to um, combine uh, some numbers in this case, but you could combine any kind of data. It could be strings in quotations, or it could be other kinds of data too. It could be integers. It could be decimal values like this. So I'm just going to combine it. I'm going to type this in and assign my variable. We have to um, separate the values in a uh, function like this with commas. And this will make a vector. We'll learn all of this language in the next few boot camps. It will take this vector and we'll assign it in our space to the container called my variable. And I'm just going to pull this open so that we can see up here. And um, this is just a variable. It's going to pop. Um, th this is for data frames. So th this one is going to pop up down here. And it's going to say my variable, my underscore variable with those values that I put in it. And I'm going to submit it now. You can keep your eyes uh, in the global environment. Three, two, one. And over here, we can now see that it's uh, my variable. It tells us a little information. It's numeric. It tells us there are um, consecutively one, two, three values, and it tells us a little bit about what the values are. So I'm just going to continue that. We can, um, we can, way that I say about functions or anything that does work for you numerically or other kinds of work, maybe it could be text kind of work or file management work, but usually we're talking about statistical analysis or numerical work. Anything that does work usually will be done by a function, and all functions have names. And one little bit of work we're going to do now is calculate the mean of the numbers contained in the container called my variable. So calculate the mean of my variable. All functions have a name 
and have an open and closing bracket. And then we put stuff inside the function brackets that uh, we want the work being done to usually. Um, again, we'll, we'll talk a lot about functions in a future one. So um, when I when I submit this, I'm not telling it to make anything new, so nothing's going to happen over here. But what I expect down here in the um, console is the it will echo my command, and then it will produce the answer. It will give us the mean of those numbers. So you can keep your eyes down in the console. I'm going to submit it now. Three, two, one. So it um, echoed my command, and it gives us the uh, numerical mean. <clears throat> we have a little bit of warning message here as well, um, but we can just ignore that for now. We're almost out of time. We have just enough time to calculate the standard deviation of my variable. Now, by this time, you're getting the idea of how to submit commands to, uh, to RStudio, how a comment works, and where um, to look for some different kinds of outputs in the interface. And really, that's the goal for this first section. So let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> you don't have to type the comments exactly like I have done them. Um, you can write your own comments, or you can write them just to practice typing um, like I have, but notice this one thing. This is another little tip I wanted to show you, and it's the last thing that we have time to do today. And that's that I've typed the name of my function, I've made my brackets. Um, you may or may not have noticed that I didn't type a closing bracket. R Studio made that closing bracket when it saw that I made an opening bracket because it assumed I was making a function, which I was. And just to help me out, it typed that closing bracket. Now, I've typed my underscore V-A-R-I. And to, just to help me out, RStudio recognizes that up in the global environment is a variable called my underscore V-A-R-I A-B-L-E. And so to help me out, it says, hey, I bet you're going to type a, B, L, E there. So what I can do, I could click on it there, or once you get the first few letters of a variable or a function name, as a matter of fact, it's in your global environment, you can just hit enter and it will type the rest for you. It's kind of a neat little trick. I'm just going to submit this. Look down in the console. Three, two, one. We have our standard deviation. It echoes my command in my comment, and it gives us the answer. The last thing that I wanted to say is that um, notice that the text is is blue and there's a little asterisk next to it. I think that might be hard for people to see, but um, this is the visual cue, and it really the R Studio is all about giving you little helpful things and visual cues. Um, a thing I didn't even explicitly mention was that um, when I compared the text, simple text in Notepad of, of all the commands in this script, it was just black text against a white background. But there's a, there is a color code to the, um, to the different parts of the, co the code in our studio by default. <clears throat> this visual cue means that we haven't saved our script. So we can um, click the Save Current. I'm just mousing over it, and you see the tooltip says that Control plus S also does that. So if I save that now, I've saved the changes that I've made with the script, and it's safe just to close R. <clears throat> when I start R as well, uh, I'll demonstrate this next week, um, I like to clear the global environment no matter what. So I click this little broom, and I do want to get rid of everything. And now it's dumped all of the things that were living in memory. And I can also do that with a console down here by clicking the broom. 
a nice thing about R and the whole R system is that if somebody else wanted to replicate this or I wanted to replicate it, I could just select the whole script, run the whole script, and I've got it all back exactly where I left off, all my output, my graph, everything. It's one of the really nice things about the R system. Are there any questions in this second? I just have one or two more remarks to make with the slide. Are there any questions or comments right this second? If there aren't, I'll just say that um, what I think we can do um, next week, we, we used up more, a little more time than I thought we would today. I think probably if we get on with it, especially if um, after we get going, after the first few sessions, we'll probably be able to do one or two pages even in a given week. Next week, um, I'm going to introduce what I call the passive aggressive Butler, <clears throat> which is the R syntactic sy system. It's that abstract way of thinking about your data living in R space and about what to do when you make an error and you get a, a, a comment back from the R system that's passive aggressive and how to get help, how to help yourself. So we'll go through this together, looking at some syntax based basics. And I think we'll be able to do two pages next week, but we will have time to do this at our own pace. In the meantime, while we're doing this, um, at the end of every at the end of every section, there are some exercises. Now, people may want to work on their own, but I just wanted to remind you that I intend us to use this time together to work together in real time. So. Let, let's use this time to do the boot camp. If you're if you're anxious and you want to go ahead, that's totally fine. When you get to the end, uh, there are exercises. Now, um, I have made some of the exercises. I've made three kinds of questions in the exercises. I've made one kind of question that's it's pretty easy. If you're, you know, anybody should be able to read it if you've read the page. I've made number, another kind of question that requires a little more thought. It's medium difficulty, and there are a few that are more difficult that require some creative creativity, really some problem solving, and maybe some things that are outside, maybe pulling together ideas outside of the pages. So uh, th I mean for those to be discussed. I, I don't mean for all of the exercises to breeze through. That'd be a pretty boring tutorial. And critically, at the end of every page, I ask you to write one question appropriate to that page for yourself. So what I would like to do every week is for people to come uh, in the session, write a, uh, a question starting next week, and, it, and we'll use the last 10 minutes or so to solve each other's questions, or maybe just to, to share each other's questions. That's all I've got for this week. That's it. That's an introduction to the boot camp. We'll do this for a few weeks, and in a few weeks time, we'll, we'll just have a little conversation about how it's going. You can let me know if you want to continue it, if we're going too fast or too slow. That's all I've got. Any any final questions or comments? Pleasure. Let me know if you'd like to be added to the Python list. I have Juliana, Eugenia, Nyambura, Elsadig, and Gustavo. Anybody else, send me an email and I'll see everyone later. Have a good evening. Hope that was useful.